Hey everyone, and welcome to this podcast. Once again, we're focusing on Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison. Uh, I'm going to be reading today from a letter that is dated May 29, 1944. And focusing on a few different issues that uh, we, we've touched on before, talking about God at the center, Christ as the center. But it, I think it's also important to recognize how much Bonhoeffer loved music and how music played an important role in his life. And that, you know, if he hadn't become a theologian or a pastor, he maybe would have wanted to be a musician. Although I think he said at one time his fingers were too fat or something like that to play the piano well. But music influenced him. Uh, At his time in Harlem, when he was in the United States, he was influenced by the spirituals and the blues, and he brought a lot of that back to Germany with him. Um, And so he he uses some of the language of music to uh, make sense of Christianity and faith and life. And today we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, He talks about life being polyphonic. And what does that mean? Um, and how does that speak to his understanding of uh, Christian faith? So, um, I just want to start reading the letter and then kind of work through some things and then stop at different points and, and have a conversation. So, it starts this way. Dear Eberhard, I hope that despite the air raids, you both are enjoying to the full the peace and beauty of these warm, summery days of Pentecost. Inwardly, one learns gradually to put life-threatening things in proportion. Actually, put in proportion sounds too negative, too formal, or artificial, or stoic. One should more correctly say that we just take in these daily threats as part of the totality of our lives. I often notice hereabouts how few people there are who can harbor many different things at the same time. When bombers come, they are nothing but fear itself. When there's something good to eat, nothing but greed itself. When they fail to get what they want, they become desperate. If something succeeds, that's all they'll see. They are missing out on the fullness of life and on the wholeness of their own existence. Everything, whether objective or subjective, disintegrates into fragments. Christianity, on the other hand, puts us into many different dimensions of life at the same time. In a way, we accommodate God and the whole world within us. We weep with those who weep at the same time as we rejoice with those who rejoice. We fear, and I've just been interrupted again by the siren, so I'm sitting outdoors enjoying the sun for our lives. But at the same time, we must think thoughts that are much more important to us than our lives. During an air raid, for example, as soon as we are turned in a direction other than worrying about our own safety, for example, by the task of spreading calm around us, the situation becomes completely different. Life isn't pushed back into a single dimension, but it is kept multidimensional, polyphonic. What a liberation it is to be able to think and to hold on to these many dimensions of life in our thoughts. So, what's really interesting to me is here Bonhoeffer seems to be wrestling with the nature of what it means to live as a human creature and the various dimensions of what it means to live as a human creature. And what I think is important about this piece and eventually culminates in him talking about Christ the center or God in the midst of our life, is how dualistic Christianity can often become, where we want to separate out what is spiritual and what is not, what is worldly, and or what is holy and what is profane, and we create these boundaries between these things. And in some way, I think that is a part of what Bonhoeffer is getting at here. We're able to hold the multiplicity of the different experiences of what it means to be a human creature together. And a lot of Christianity and a lot of religion really seems to focus in either on morality or on worship or on a certain version of spirituality and quote unquote godliness that is otherworldly, that leaves behind 
the uh, important cultural aspects of, of what it means to be a human person. So that to be spiritual is not to be creaturely. Uh, to be spiritual is in some ways to overcome our human existence. And one of the things that I've wanted to point out as we've worked through these letters and this idea of religion, this Christianity, is that Bonhoeffer is suggesting true spirituality is multidimensional. And it's an affirmation of what it means to be a human creature, what it means to live as a human being and experience the, the goodness of created life alongside the struggles and suffering of created life. And, and what does that mean and what does that look like? And so he's going to suggest, or I, I, here's my claim. I think he is suggesting that a religionless form of Christianity is going to hold together the multi-dimensions of human life. And that's what he means by polyphonic. Polyphonic music is when you've got all these multiple voices doing all of these different things, and together they make this beautiful piece of music. And so religionless Christianity is a way of recognizing spirituality in the midst of our humanity and creatureliness, in the midst of our work, our politics, our play, our family life, our sexuality, all of these things. There's a spirituality that holds these all of these things together. And then if we take that seriously, we recognize that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not taking us out of a world or out of these different modes of being, but trying to restore us to them, trying to give them back to us. There's a reconciliation happening. And in that way, Christianity is about a way of life. Uh, and we'll see here in a little bit where he's, he's not, it's, it's not about solving a problem. So, um, I want, to, I want to skip just a little bit ahead where he is talking about Weissacker's book on physics. So, he says, Weiss, Weiss, uh, Weissacker's book on physics continues to preoccupy me. So, again, he's writing to Bethke a great deal. It has again brought home to me quite clearly that we shouldn't think of God as the stopgap for the incompleteness of our knowledge. Because then, as an ob objectively inevitable, when the boundaries of knowledge are pushed even further, God too is pushed further away and thus is ever on the retreat. So what he's saying is, when, when, we, when we push God into those places where we don't have the answers, then when we do get the answer, we continue to push God off to the edges. And he's talked about this before, where, where we push God to the boundaries or the edges of life, and he's saying that Christ needs in, in Christ, God is at the center of life. But here's what he says. We should find God in what we know, not in what we don't know. God wants to be grasped by us, not in unsolved questions, but in those that have been solved. This is true in the relation between God and scientific knowledge, but it is also true of the universal human questions about death, suffering, and guilt. Today, even for these questions, there are human answers that can completely disregard God. So, what he seems to be saying there is, like atheists or, or people who aren't, you know, uh, they don't believe in God, come up with answers or solutions to try to deal with things like death and suffering and, and so on, these unanswerable things uh, in human existence. Humans, uh, human beings cope with these questions practically without God and have done so throughout the ages, and it is simply not true that only Christianity would have a solution to them. As for the idea of a solution, we would have to say that the Christian answers are just as uncompelling or just as compelling as other possible solutions. So, what he seems to be granting here is that when people wrestle with these mysteries of life, these difficulties of life, um, these liminal experiences, if you will, psychology, sociology, all of, all of these different ways of thinking about they're providing answers, provide just as good or bad answers as religion does. And so he's saying that the Christian answers can be just as compelling or uncompelling. But here he goes, he goes, here too, God is not a stopgap. We must recognize God not only where we reach the limits of our possibilities, God wants to be recognized in the midst of our lives. 
in life and not only in dying and health and in strength and not only in suffering in action and not only in sin. The ground for this lies in the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. God is the center of life and doesn't just turn up when we have unsolved problems to be solved. So again, let me reread that little first part where he says, God wants to be recognized in the midst of our lives, in life and not only in dying, in health and strength and not only in suffering, in action and not only in sin. So again, what Bonhoeffer is pointing towards is that God is present in Jesus Christ in the midst of our human experience. And let me put it away that I often will say to my students that in Jesus Christ, we get an affirmation of the human experience. That what the incarnation and the Christian understanding of the incarnation is about is an affirmation of what it means to live as a human being. And I think so often what what some Christians have done and the religion you know religion has done is turned Christianity simply into a solution or an answer to a problem. And so we end up with all this negativity with sin and guilt and shame and all of this. And I am not denying the existence of sin and evil and and so on. But what Bonhoeffer seems to be suggesting is that there's a bigger way of thinking about Christian faith in which it is an affirmation of human life. It is an affirmation of the joy of what it means to live as a human being and a human creature. And that God is present just as much in physics and biology and evolutionary theory in all of the scientific discoveries that we make. And again, one of the things he's trying to say is, too often, like we say, okay, we figure this part out. So, uh, but you know, there's an, a part of it we don't know, and so that's we just say, well, that's God, and that's pushing God to the periphery or the boundary. Uh, and Bonhoeffer suggesting that God has to be at the center of of what we know, of what we explore. And so this is this is the thing that I don't understand is why people see scientific inquiry and, and scientific thought as a threat to Christian belief. Now, in some way, what you have are the atheists who are just as metaphysical as the as religious people who are doing the same thing. Uh, and they're kind of excluding the possibility of God within. And even though Richard Dawkins has this book, you know, the I can't remember the name of it, but like the magic of life. It's almost as if he's opened up to the possibility of mystery and magic, but has such a shallow understanding of faith and God. And, and what I, you know, what I would suggest is that Bonhoeffer is, is trying to push back against that shallowness and deepen our understanding of what that could be. So that the, the, the beauty of something like evolutionary thought can be a place where God is present, where human beings are at work figuring things out. The, the telescope you know, that we just launched that opens up the cosmos to us and these stars and these galaxies that we see, there's something beautiful there. And Bonhoeffer wants to suggest that it is there where God is present at the center of human activity at the center of uh, human human thought, and wants us to get away from simply seeing Christianity and the Incarnation as a solution to whatever. And again, I, I, I need to emphasize this dichotomy that in, in Christianity that can be there, where so many you know, conservative Christians, fundamentalist Christians, want to suggest that the whole point is for God to take us away from our humanity and away from this world. And Bonhoeffer is saying no to that, that in Christ, God is present in the midst. But he does also doesn't want to go to this kind of liberal perspective to simply say that God is a, a human projection and and wants to suggest that, no, there's, there's a there there, there's a, a presence a spirit. So it's interesting that he's talking about all of this in the context of Pentecost, the outpouring of the spirit that makes us alive as human beings and affirms human um, our humanity and human activity. Uh, and so I'll just I'll just 
finish up here reading the the end here of the the first part of the letter anyway. So he says, The ground for this lies in the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. God is the center of life and doesn't just turn up when we have unsolved problems to be solved. Seen from the center of life, certain questions fall away completely. And likewise, the answers to such questions, I'm thinking of the judgment pronounced on Job's friends. In Christ, there are no Christian problems. Enough on this. I've just been interrupted again. So it's interesting at the end of this is he's interrupted with the sirens going off because bombs are falling. This last part emphasizes the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And we have to understand that for Bonhoeffer, revelation is significant. He is opposed to Nazi ideology. He is opposed to uh, starting from that kind of human perspective in which we build our towers of Babel and end up worshiping a God who is not God, the God of ideology. So, God has to speak. We have to allow God to speak. And in Jesus Christ, we see and we hear what God says. And what God says is an affirming grace and love for humanity and all of creation. And he's saying God is at the center of all of it and doesn't just turn up when we've got a problem to be solved. Um, and, And this is the interesting thing. And the book of Job is so fascinating. And, um, you know, I, I, when I teach the Bible it, to some of my students, too, we spend some time on Job as this kind of counter narrative to the book of Proverbs, which is saying, like, look, follow God's law, follow God's will, all will go well with you. And Job is like, here's Job, he's upright, he's living according to the law, and his friends come along and are accusing him of, you know, he's suffering because he's done something wrong. He's disobeyed God, and God is angry with him, and who are you to challenge God? What's interesting is all of these friends who are saying this throughout the book, in the end, they're the ones that God is mad with. And these friends sound just like the religious people that Bonhoeffer is pushing against. And I would argue that they sound a lot like some pastors uh, in my neck of the woods where, you know, they have certainty and it's all about doctrine uh, and it's all about excluding people and sin and guilt and so on. These are the ones that God comes and and is ready to to destroy, and Job has to step in, and Job becomes this mediator. In fact, throughout the book of Job, Job doesn't want anything to do with what they're saying, and is saying, look, I need a lawyer. I need someone to advocate for me. And in a sense, Christ is the one who comes now and is our advocate. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, Christ stands. God stands with us. God with us, right? Emmanuel. Uh, and turns and is saying, "What's going? Why have you forsaken me?" And so, in the death and the resurrection of Christ, we see the presence of God in the midst of our world. We see God stand in solidarity with humanity, uh, and, and we see an affirmation of the human creature. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't sin and things have gone haywire, but. Sometimes it seems as though in conservative Christianity, when the emphasis is on um, Christianity as a problem, solving a problem, it's they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Not only do they want to deal with sin, but they also want to throw out our own humanity, and, and they're almost afraid of our humanity. And I'm wondering if many of the young people who are leaving the church today and people who are leaving institutionalized forms of religion today are not, aren't, maybe they're just sick of it. Um, there's a sense in which they love life and they experience that love of life through art or through music or food or travel or friendship or whatever. And like I said in one of the other podcasts, they're not getting rid of faith, but they're exchanging one form of faith for another. They see some of these things in the church as being archaic and are, are longing for a message that affirms the good things of this life and that we can find the presence of God in the midst of these things. And this is what Bonhoeffer is suggesting here. And he's doing it as he sits in prison. He's doing it as bombs are falling all around him. 
And I want to suggest, you know, this comes after his whole religionless Christianity conversation, that he's still thinking about and wrestling with the, you know, what Christian faith is saying about who God is and what it means to be a human creature and how God is at work in the world in Jesus. So again, just to think about it this way, religionless faith is not getting rid of beliefs in the incarnation or redemption and and all of these things. It is asking significant questions about the word that is spoken in Jesus Christ, about the reconciliation and salvation that is, is proclaimed in Jesus Christ. And Bonhoeffer is asking, post-World War II, what is the church going to look like? And what will the task of the church be? And the task of the church, of the Christian community, will be to proclaim the affirmation of God's good creation and the transformation that is taking place. And that we then are to become the signs of God's love and God's affirmation of the human being. And we do that by loving our neighbor. And this seems to me to be the type of faith that, at least in the Western world, people are longing for. And what does that mean for us, those of us who are part of the church, those of us who are leaders in the church? What does that mean for us? What is that going to look like for us? And I think a big part of this is taking on this polyphonic perspective, recognizing that the church is penultimate. It is not the point. Uh, The church is to be for the world, and God is at work in the world, both dealing with evil and sin, but also affirming what is good and bringing transformation and renewal. And that we, those of us who follow Jesus, need to be signs of this love and this grace.